and welcome to the Global Dialogue podcast. My name is Maro Siam. And I'm Teresa Doe. We're joining you here from Ryerson University. And this is the first of five different podcasts that we'll be hosting weekly. Today's topic is about the ongoing trial for the New Delhi gang rape. The rape occurred in mid-December on a moving bus. It was a woman and her friend who were on a bus, a 9.30 bus, during which an altercation occurred and resulted in the rape of the young woman. She was later taken to Singapore for treatment and... Uh, Two died. weeks after that. And died two weeks after. Um, so there's been a lot of questions about this trial, you know, regarding the death penalty. Should the death penalty be um, be the the ultimate solution? Um, what what led to this incident in the first place? What are the sociocultural factors? And uh, what can be done to change things moving forward in India? So we will start off our discussion today with the social and cultural context behind sexual violence and, you know, what factors may have led to the rape in a religious cultural aspect and so I think we should get started Marwa some people say that it's family behavior that influences the behavior of men um, I had a really interesting conversation with Professor Parveen Gill um, she was one of the organizers of the Toronto silent protest on January 3rd and she had a lot of interesting things to say among which was that the cultural environment that somebody is raised in is not a contributor to, to that behavior. So it's not your financial situation, it's not your social status, but it's actually the upbringing that you're subject to that really determines your behavior. Where do you think that, how did that disconnect happen when, I mean, women were the spiritual leaders and they were those idols to be worshipped and now suddenly they are almost regarded as worthless? Professor Gill actually said that it's it's very, um, very connected to the social hierarchy, so there's a culture of domination, but it's not direct. She said that women are not expected to resist, and she says what she believes happened in that bus in New Delhi was that the woman resisted. She refused to be called names, she refused to be questioned on why she was riding a bus in, at, at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and that resistance is what really triggered uh, the behavior of the men on the bus. Um, I believe the culture of domination is nobody goes back to the source anymore, so nobody will really uh, connect with their spiritual beliefs or, or their spiritual leaders anymore. People will, will likely develop their own beliefs and they'll lose sight of that spirituality. And that's when things start to go wrong. Right, right. Because I had read an article in the Atlantic magazine and uh, this article was about Indian mythology and how uh, Indian princesses could be role models for children today as opposed to these Disney princesses. And the author of the article gave a beautiful example of a princess named, I think, Draupadi. Excuse my mispronunciation there, but it did mention a part when she was a queen. Uh, she was dragged to court and stripped down. Her husband, her warrior husbands, did not stand to protect her because they were bound by a code of honor. Patriarchal note, that was the, uh, the side note there. In this situation, the princess cursed, she fumed, she resisted, she demanded her own rights as a woman and as a queen. And earlier in the story, she had been abused by one of her husbands. But in this situation, this princess was fierce. She was allowed to resist. She was allowed to demand her own rights as a human citizen, as a as a princess, as a, um, as a woman. And she was praised for it. And so it's strange to see that things have changed what was a myth and what was being passed down to generations back then is suddenly just completely ignored or maybe even forgotten today. Um, I, I'd like to bring in a little yeah. interview with Professor Parveen Gill. Okay. She did organize uh, the, the protest with her friend on January 3rd, and the result was amazing. They had over 300 members sign the petition, which was handed into the Indian consulate, and there was over 150 participants or protesters um, so I, we're going to listen to the yeah. interview, and we'll get back. Do we think that female leadership could be a contributor to, to changing societies? Or is it not the female leadership that we need, but yet male response? Female leadership is already there. It's very paradoxical, very paradoxical. India is known as land of spirituality, right? Where woman is considered as goddess and creator. Women leadership has always been in India, always. Women leadership in terms of um, family nurturing, family building, from business organizations, being executives, being entrepreneurs, being president of, you know, India. So it has always been there, leadership. So I think when you go by the historical background, facts and figures and numbers, 
and then you try to analyze I think it's more of male response which is required number one and number two women they feel socially powerless but they they need to come forward and they need to raise their voice individually or collectively even if they are raising their voice again the system as such is not cooperative so um, I think male response societal response government response in terms of this is very very important um, I don't see any lack of women leadership in, in India for sure I worked there I was a professional woman but there was times when even my husband or my family will say oh you're going at this point of time meeting your friends or visiting someone take driver with you don't drive yourself the whole idea was there should be a male member with you right in a very subtle way but again that conviction that was a myth basically because with this girl what happened there was a male member with her so where are we going the question we need to ask ourselves is where are we going in terms of India which the world say, says it's going to be super economic power what in terms of GDP 7% 8% that's what you call India as super economic power where women are not safe they can't even walk there you know they freely after six o'clock they're not supposed to get out of their houses so that's economic power you're talking about what kind of economic power you're talking about right so it's very very paradoxical so what we need is more of a male response and more of empathy if somebody is coming to you take that girl's complaint seriously there's a conscience that we all have somebody who desires to rape is going out of their nature because unfortunately when somebody tells someone or when a parent or a family member tells a girl don't dress a certain way don't walk in the street at a certain time, don't go out past a certain hour. It's basically saying that it's natural for men to want to rape, that it's natural for yeah. men to want to harass, and what you need to do is force them out of that nature. So it's almost an insult to men to say that women can't walk in the street at night or can't dress a certain way. To say a woman is the reason for her rape is to say that man is by nature an animal. Yeah. So it's, I feel like the best way to change this would be male criticism, am I correct? Like self-criticism. Self-criticism, yeah, yeah. The whole idea is uh, why I, being female, cannot go out of my house. Problem is not with me. So if the problem is with man, for that matter, then keep that person in home. Why do you stop me to go out? You see my point? It's very, very difficult. But it's mutual. Mutual in the sense uh, it's both ways. And it hasn't improved over the period of time when I was a young girl I can not say now something has changed it or improved rather it has worsened not improved to be very honest especially northern India and in the um, small villages and even in Delhi which is a capital city so um, answering your question here there should be gender equality why why do I need to say man woman it's very interesting all the bad words in Hindi language are actually for females. There is not even a single bad word for which starts or which meant to degrade men. All bad words are for women, right? So where is this gender equality? Why, I, why do I need to say men versus woman or male, female? Till the time we don't even start you know, sowing the seed of gender equality, as I said from the day one, nothing is going to change. It's all about mindset. It will take centuries, but what are we doing at this point of time to change that mindset? This was revolution, as you said rightly. This, this was definitely a revolution when people, irrespective of their gender, you know, they, they stood by each other. They are protesting continuously for this cause. So that's what we call revolution, right? Uh, when it comes to the same male's wife or sister, right? How could they take a totally different stand then, right? Why don't they put themselves into other person's shoes first? It's so complex and I think gender equality through laws, through education, through family ties, values, 
that's important. That's very, very important. So my final question is, if this trial doesn't go according to expectation, as a reflexive um, response, people have said they want there to be a capital punishment. Others have said there needs to be severe punishment, but not a death penalty. What do you feel would be the ultimate solution? I don't promote death penalty at all. I'm not in favor of capital punishment. If not capital punishment, but something. It's if you think it's again rarest of the cases, you know, bring justice to that girl family, to the system as a whole. I think it's not about that girl only. It's bringing justice to the system as a whole. It's bringing in the confidence back in females. Okay, it's okay to walk on the streets safely, right? It's bringing in that confidence because it's not only about punishment. It's about killing the confidence of of perpetrators. Yes, basically, right? So uh, no one will actually want that to see. Miss Gill, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate uh, speaking with you today. And uh, thank you so much for all your insights. No, thank you so much, Marwa, for giving me this opportunity. It was a great pleasure meeting with you. Thank you. Wow, that was, that was certainly illuminating. <laughs> Let's talk about the the trial right now, the ongoing trial. I think it's just like uh, M- Mrs. Gill said, it's very difficult to decide. Um, this could end up being a damaging result if it isn't the death penalty, but at the same time, a lot of people who weren't in favor of the death penalty are now for it. Um, it's, it's confusing because you want the punishment to be as severe as possible, mm-hmm. but you don't want to evade the initial incident. We don't want to, to hide or to, to bury the blame or to bury, you know, the the mistake that was made. It's important to, it's important to discuss this. I feel like with the death penalty, it buries everything. It buries the whole case. The father of, of the victim himself wants capital punishment, but we can only imagine the anger and the sadness he has to endure. I feel like it, it doesn't need to be a death penalty, but there needs to be an alternative, and it needs to be something ongoing. There needs to be an education process. There needs to be treatment. There needs to be um, diagnoses, and it's not something that will stop now. Unfortunately, it'll take a really long time, and I think the longer it takes for something to be done, the more people will react. Mm-hmm, that's true, and, and it's so important for the judge to reach a level-headed decision on this case because this will set precedent. People will refer to this case years on and say, well, this is the answer to rape. And you're right when you were saying that it, it takes away the problem, like it eliminates the problem. And so is it necessary for to not have the death penalty so that these perpetrators can atone for their sins? I, it's such a hard question to answer because <laughs> I, I wouldn't, it, it's really tough to decide. I mean, as women, this, this hits home for a lot of us too. It could have been any of us on that bus at 9.30 p.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, it was a very normal day for a young woman in India. It's incredibly difficult to imagine the outcome, um, and it's sickening, but it's also important to, to, to realize that death doesn't fix a problem. Um, there's also the, the big question about the 17-year-old or the, 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 the accused who is believed to be 17 years old. Um, we don't know where this is going. We don't know if he's going to be trialed as an adult or if he's going to be trialed as a juvenile. Um, wh- what do you think this uh, how this should uh, this should unfo- unfold? His well, certainly. I mean, this goes back to the mental processes of of a child or a teenager versus the mental processes of an adult. And I think he being seventeen years old, and people said that he could be, you know, that's the minimum age he could be. But I believe that he was the one who called upon his busmates to inflict this damage and, and to rape this young woman, and so. I believe personally that he should be tried as an adult because he was f- fully aware of what he was doing and the pain that it could cause someone else. And that doesn't matter, you know, seven months from now when he turns 18. Yeah, and th- the scary part is he can he can be out of prison within a year exactly. if he is trial if he's not trialed as an adult. So, mm-hmm. um, and there's obviously no more media access to to the trial. I mean, th- this this case became what it is because of the media. Well, why was there a media blackout? It was, it was, I guess, it was mainly to 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 protect the identities of the accused, mm-hmm. and it was also to to minimize the uh, the attention this case is getting because there was a lot of there were a lot of reporters and a lot of journalists who were uh, who had access to the trial, and there was, mm-hmm. I mean, there was regulations about not publishing pictures of the accused or not disclosing the name of the victim. So there's a lot of privacy around this uh, this trial already. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a, mainly to maintain it, but also to to minimize the 
the dramatic reaction to right. this. So right. I think I think it's a it's a problem. There needs to be access. There needs to be rights. There needs to be exposure. And and I hope this could change at some point. I believe that moving forward, that women report rapes and her sexual harassment. And so that will just change the culture that's prevalent now. And to have these cultural conversations as opposed to just stifling and nipping it in the butt. I agree. I agree. And first and foremost, we need to shatter the the concept of uh, of fear of reporting rapes or the the concept of of equating shame with honesty. And even reporting it to to police. I mean, there's obviously a problem with the police force in India, but that's a whole other issue that we won't get into today. Um, But male intervention, there were many campaigns in India after it happened where we see men standing in solidarity with women, and that has been a powerful powerful impact on the protest itself because this wasn't just a woman's issue. This is about a cultural and societal issue where both men and women are responsible for what happens. Well, I'm really happy to see that it spread all the way here because we need to stay angry. I really think we do. No, definitely. This has been a very interesting discussion. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Teresa. And my name is Marwa. And thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.